Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Ramon Alvarez Pedrosa, head of investor relations at Repsol since June this year. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to our fifth sustainability day, my first one here at Deutsche Bank uh, premises. Uh, as you will have the opportunity to hear throughout today, uh, sustainability is very much embedded in Repsol business culture and strategy. And I can attest that because of my previous roles as heading risk management, safety, and environmental efforts. And these matter were and continue to be key priorities to the entire organization. But before we move on, we will, I would like you to remind to read our disclaimer page, which is on page two on the brochure you have. Otherwise, our legal team will tell me off. So please make sure you read it carefully. Uh, following today's presentations, a Q&A session will take place, uh, following by an informal lunch. Uh, we invite everyone to stay and use this opportunity to talk to our seniors man to senior management. Uh, and I will be delighted to meet you uh, whom I haven't met yet. Uh, we believe that our senior management leadership in environmental, social, and governance matters and their active involvement in communicating our ESG goals is best in class. But we want to continue being at the forefront of ESG communication with investors, so please let us know if there is anything else that we can do to continue improving. Uh, following this event today, our CEO and senior management team will embark on a ESG uh, roadshow in Europe where we will be having additional one-on-one -on -one conversation with investors. And without any further ado, I leave the word to Joshua John Imaf, and I will look, look forward to meeting you all in person during the lunch. Thank you very much. Joshua John. Thank you, Ramon. Good morning, everybody. Really glad uh, being here. For you, Ramon, is your first sustainability day. For Repsol, is the fifth one. And uh, for me, it's the, the third uh, in, in row over the last three years I have been here. Uh, and uh, I'd like to, to thank, uh, of course, uh, Deutsche Bank for uh, allowing us to, to celebrate uh, this uh, sustainability day in these uh, wonderful uh, facilities and offices in the, in the middle of, of, of London. I mean, uh, allow me to start saying that today uh, is a quite relevant mm, day for, for Repsol and also for the sustainability uh, in Repsol, not only because we are here and you are here, that is a, an, an important fact, but also because today is starting uh, the activity of Repsol uh, power and gas because today, in a formal way, we are integrating the low carbon business assets we uh, acquired some months ago uh, from, uh, from Biesgo. And today is the first day of the incorporation. I mean, uh, we will have the opportunity today to discuss the rationale of this uh, integration, of this new activity of Repsol. But uh, let me say that we are happy and we are really eager uh, having the opportunity to manage this new business and most of all we are also happy welcoming uh, today the employees coming from Biesco in Repsol. I mean as you perfectly know because you are also um, most of you you have been part of this sustainability uh, uh, seminars or, or days in, in London in some way, the environment, sustainability, and governance concept is fully embedded, as Ramon said, in the DNA of, of Repsol. Uh, we were, in some way, uh, pioneers uh, in launching this, this concept in, in the sector, and transparency on, on this kind of, uh, of issues and matters is fully embedded in, in our character. We are passionately committed uh, to confirm that today, the 
the base of our stakeholders uh, with this using this kind of criteria of ESG is uh, a relevant and important part uh, in, in Repsol. Uh, on a personal level, I am also very pleased uh, being here. And being here this year, as we were uh, talking about now, Luis, with Luis Cabra in his new function of uh, uh, managing director of the area of uh, technology, digital, uh, sustainability and resources, and with Antonio Lorenzo uh, in his new function as uh, CFO. For you also, Antonio, in this function is your first uh, sustainability day. Uh, in our most recent uh, shareholder identification report, we could confirm that today the, the shareholder base of uh, investors uh, investing with ESG criteria is increasing uh, its weight uh, in Repsol. At present, 22% of our institutional health shareholder base, so we are talking about 150 million shares out of 680 million shares that are institutional investors in Repsol, is managed by institutional investors who integrate elements of ESG factors in their investment decision. I mean, that is, uh, represents an increase of 110% over the last year. And that is a very important fact. Uh, for us. 2018 uh, has been an important year uh, for the company in terms of uh, strategy and sustainability. During this year, we have uh, put the end to a journey that was uh, initiated in 2015 with the acquisition of, of, of Talisman. As you very well know, following that uh, acquisition, uh, Repsol ran a very strict 2016 2020 strategic plan focused on savings and efficiencies and targeting the reduction of capex uh, of the combined uh, operation of uh, the former talisman and the legacy Repsol, reducing this capex by a half. We closed uh, 2017 with a capex figure of 3 billion euros while delivering free cash flow at break even $40 per barrel in organic terms for the whole company. We dramatically reduce our net debt and stabilize uh, our business at investment grade. And finally, we made a strategic move that we uh, materialized in, in February of this year, divesting our historical non-operated uh, stake in gas natural fenosa with the ambition to build a low carbon operated business. Uh, this uh, journey, let me say this successful journey, was all accomplished ahead of our original 2020 goal. So after uh, accomplishing and, and, and closing these targets, we needed new targets and we decided uh, to redefine the path of the company from now until 2020. And that was the reason of presenting in, in, in June the strategic update. And uh, this update uh, was mainly based uh, in three main targets. The first, improve the shareholder's return, improving in terms of, uh, let me say, in qu quantitative terms, I mean the 8% of growth of the dividend, but also in qualitative terms, because you know that we define a buyback program to uh, get rid of any kind of dilution coming from the, the script modality over the period. Secondly, the, the growth, uh, pushing the growth of, the, of our portfolio, uh, either in downstream and uh, or in the upstream business, and finally thrive in the energy uh, transition. I'm going to, to stress this fact of, uh, of uh, thriving and entering in the energy uh, transition of, of Repsol. I mean, uh, the change in the energy uh, framework scenario is going to impact the whole society, but is also going to impact the oil and gas uh, companies. I mean, there are a lot of uh, factors that are impacting uh, uh, our sector uh, in, this, in this journey. First, uh, regulation towards a less carbonized world in every sector, including our sector, is going to be important, with technology accelerating some of these trends, along with also the change in the habits of consumers going in the same uh, directions. Uh, all these trends will impact energy consumption, and I want Repsol to be part of this new arena. This new arena that is changing that, and is in transition, but we want to be part of this new arena. And that will imply designing our products around the new needs of our clients. Uh, we are a company 
truly supportive of the Paris uh, Agreement. Uh, we are also conscious that the challenge of the two degrees scenario uh, is going to be very challenging for our industry and our task is to uh, change progressively our portfolio towards this uh, ambition. We want to evolve from being a pure oil and gas company to being an energy company. And we are committed to developing this uh, strong position we have uh, in Spain, created in the Iberian Peninsula, successful wholesale gas business, and delivering a competitive gas offer to our uh, retail clients. I mean, thanks to the acquisition of the low carbon business of PSGO that we will discuss uh, today, we have made the most of our opportunities, creating a new business line, aiming to achieve uh, over a 5% market share with a number of clients in the gas and power business in Spain by 2025, and 4.5 gigawatts uh, capacity of, uh, of power generation. Uh, this will help lead us to our ambition of transforming uh, Repsol to become a multi-energy uh, supplier. Uh, the VSO acquisition has not been the only step uh, we have uh, taken in this direction of uh, going forward in a less carbonized uh, company. Repsol has also uh, entered into the Valde Solar project through the acquisition of a society that already holds the administrative permissions to build a solar plant in Spain. Uh, this Valde Solar uh, acquisition reflects the growing path in renewables that Repsol established in the strategic update. We are going to, to follow uh, the, the path, uh, the roadmap we define in this uh, strategic uh, update. This is a greenfield project and uh, our target uh, is uh, to be online at the end of 2019, uh, making it one of the biggest solar plants in Spain with 264, I think, megawatts of, uh, of, of capacity. And this acquisition support our vision of uh, recognizing, first of all, gas as the best uh, energy source to transition to a low decarbonized world. Natural gas uh, will play a key role uh, as a substitute of coal to produce uh, power. And uh, let me underline that in my perception, natural gas is the best partner for management of the on and off, I mean, the, the uh, intermittency generation through re renewables being the appropriate backup for those. I mean, this binomial of renewables plus natural gas uh, is uh, going uh, to be the most cost efficient way to reduce emission in the power sector uh, in, in the future. In terms of uh, next steps in the renewable sector, we will continue to analyze more opportunities within the Repsol's portfolio uh, in order to achieve the targets uh, we committed in, in our strategic update. Uh, but let me underline an important aspect. Uh, we want to be very cautious about the return we are going <coughs> to obtain in this kind of projects. I mean, being decarbonized is a target, has to be a must, but we have to balance all that with the returns we are going to, to get to capture in this sector. So uh, we will requ require uh, a, minimum of, a minimum of a 9 or 10 percent of return or any single investment we are going to launch in, in this uh, sector. And if we take the total return expected by 2025, combining the retail commercial side and the power generation side, 12 percent is the return of projects we expect to have in this sector uh, by 2025. And let me say, I mean, we are not going to invest below these metrics because uh, we want to be uh, an actor in this uh, sector, but we want to be a profitable uh, actor and player uh, in, in, in this sector. And that means that we need, let me say, to, to increase the, appet the appetite of, of being in the risk key part of this sector. I mean, an oil and gas company, we are, let me say, a machine that uh, uh, we manage uh, assets in our portfolio uh, with a high risk profile. Uh, we capture the, the remuneration for our shareholders uh, to finance our projects, but that our shareholders, they expect to have, uh, let me say, a high return from this investment. I mean, we have to diversify and we have to manage these assets in the right way. So also in these low carbon businesses, we have 
to uh, try to be in the uh, in the parts where returns could be higher. We are talking, of course, about the integration in the retail and commercial side, and even in the power side, in, if the gas is the, let me say, the, the natural value chain of our current business. And on top of that, we have to, to be far from any kind of subsidized or regulated business where the returns are going to be very low. That means that we have to take either uh, execution uh, risk, that means uh, going to greenfield projects instead of, uh, of buying uh, assets in operation. Secondly, uh, taking a merchant risk, uh, competing in the pure market pool as the way to, to get uh, margins and, and returns. Or on top of that, taking uh, either technological risks, as we are now, for instance, uh, Investing in a technological project in the in in, in, in the Portugal offshore uh, side in a floating uh, program, or taking the geographical uh, risk in places where we could have more opportunities or more advantages that other they have. I mean, uh, <coughs> climate change is uh, a challenge for the whole world and is also a challenge for Repsol, and we don't want to be there let me say only in terms of narrative. I mean, narrative is very important. Greenwashing, I mean, could be the option for, for some uh, uh, companies or sector. I mean, we believe on that. And we know that it's not going to be an easy journey. But we want to define a clear target and define the metrics to follow what we are going to develop in, in this journey to have a less carbonized uh, company. And, and to be more precise, uh, the company Repsol has established the ambition to reduce its carbon intensity by a 20, sorry, 40 percent by 2040. I mean, the, the carbon intensity that is, uh, we are going to measure this carbon intensity in terms of tons of CO2 uh, in our emissions per every single joule or gigajoule of energy uh, we uh, produce is the indicator that we are going to follow to, uh, to analyze how our CO2 reduction are evolving over the, the long term. Uh, our objective is to reduce this figure in a 40%. I mean, that is going to fit by 2040 with the, the, the pathway that the world needs to, uh, to fulfill the, the two degrees uh, pathway. That means the, the, the sustainable development scenario from the International Energy Agency. Uh, and the journey is going to be uh, very long, but we want to commit also Repsol in a short-term uh, commitment. And the short-term commitment is that by 2020, we are going to reduce this figure in a 3%. Uh, on top of that, I mean, as an action, uh, additionally to this 3% reduction of energy intensity, we are going to reduce uh, 2.1 million of CO2 tons uh, in, in, in this period. I mean, we are going to do that with energy efficiency in our plants, either in the upstream or the, up, the downstream, reducing our CO2 emissions. We are going to increase or leverage our gas production. We are going to increase our biofuel production in our industrial plants or refineries, reducing the methane emissions in our upstream operation that of course, are also impacting in terms of greenhouse uh, gases, and also utilizing low carbon power generation uh, to achieve uh, these uh, targets. Uh, our reforms will be supported also by the role that the petrochemicals have, helping us to design and develop projects that allow us to capture CO2. I mean, you very well know that Repsol is fully committed to this target of climate uh, change. We were perhaps the first oil and gas company supporting the Kyoto Accord in 1997. Uh, more recently, in, in 26, we established energy efficiency goals to fight uh, climate uh, change with an overall reduction of 5.2 million tons of CO2 by 2020, which we have been working towards. Uh, on top of these goals, I mean, uh, because we want to in increase the, the effort, I mean, today I, I'm happy to announce a new energy efficiency plan in Repsol uh, from now on, from 2018 to 2025. Uh, we want to reduce in 2.95 million tons of CO2 uh, by 2025, 
taking the baseline of 2017. So almost 3 million tons over this period of seven years. I mean, uh, our goals go beyond improving efficiency in our facilities because there we are, let me say, achieving some kind of asymptotic uh, target. I mean, we are uh, analyzing how to uh, implement different measures such as uh, units and network simplification, electrification of a part of our industrial plants uh, to cope with the problem of fugitive emission reduction, and of course, analyzing all the flooring and venting uh, opportunities. On top of that, we are going to, to uh, go on <coughs> applying technologies like renewable generation, CO2 capture and use, green hydrogen in our refining plants, uh, and, and so on. I mean, uh, we also want to keep a very close eye on methane uh, management, because I mean, we know that natural gas, as I said before, is part of the future uh, of the, of the uh, power a binomium, but we have to cope with the problem of the methane uh, emissions. And we are going to work there, hardly, I mean, as Repsol, but also in the framework of uh, OGCI uh, uh, team, where you know that we are uh, working, uh, sharing experiences and pushing in favor of this kind of technologies with our partners. Uh, as partner of uh, OGCI, we are committed to reduce in at 25% our methane emissions by 2025. Uh, and in, in, in this target, uh, the, the, the emission level reduction amounted to 170 kilotons uh, in, in 2017. I mean, uh, in addition to these new CO2 and methane emissions, we are also committing to reduce in at 50% uh, our routine flaring by 2025. <coughs> I mean, you could ask, why are you taking the 50% if you, you are uh, committing at the, 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 the reduction to zero of, uh, uh, of, uh, of this flaring uh, in the EMP, uh, of routine flaring, uh, routine flaring uh, to zero by 2030? I mean, is to put some kind of milestone uh, and to, to have the metrics that we are going to be able to reduce enough 50% by 2025 uh, this uh, figure. I mean, we are pleased to make all these public commitments uh, today here and be sure that we are going to push hard to uh, deliver all that we are committing today because I think that that is very important in terms of being part of this uh, energy uh, transition. On top of all these uh, environment commitments, I mean, safety is uh, also uh, very important for us. Um, I mean, and Luis. Uh, he will have the opportunity to talk later uh, about that. I mean, safety is integrated in all our decision-making uh, processes. We are further in our commitment to find ways to further transform our safety, safety culture. Uh, on top of safety, and we will have the opportunity to talk also today about that, we are uh, pushing hard in favor of the concept of circular uh, economy uh, in, in Repsol, a scenario in which the total impact of our operations is minimized. And we believe there are opportunities for us in this area and now are beginning to solidify uh, new uh, ob objectives and alternatives in the framework of the circular economy uh, in, in, in Repsol. Uh, we are taking initiatives in this area uh, our commitment to water uh, stewardship is, of course, uh, one of the main areas in terms of circular economy. We continue to work on improvements to quantify and reduce our usage. And uh, we have technologies such as uh, our industry-leading water tool used in our fracking uh, operation. So all that is going to be uh, and is in the agenda of Repsol is part and an important part of our strategic targets uh, from now on uh, to 2020, we are defining the metrics to be uh, measured over this period. But on top of that, we have the aspiration and the vision to reduce this intensity of energy in a 40% in coming uh, 22 years. Uh, let me finish this uh, conversation with an update about our, our green uh, bond that you know that we issued this green bond in, in 2017. Uh, we have issued our first uh, report of progress, which uh, includes the fact that over a half of the funds have been allocated into over 130 projects 
uh, to reduce CO2 in, in our plants. And as we see green financing as a key component of our uh, sustainability strategy going forward, uh, we have a, an open dialogue as pioneers in this uh, area in our industry with industry participants and stakeholders and follow the ongoing work of the European Union Technical Expert Group on Sustainable Finance to continue evaluating what is the best fund, the best way to fund our green projects. I mean, uh, in, in our perception, being the oil and gas sector a key player in the path of energy transition, I think that is crucial, it's a crucial task to allow our industry to participate within the process of green financing, leaving an open door to the oil and gas companies to be active players uh, on this arena. I always say that, I mean, there is no any kind of DNA contained in, in, in the CO2 molecules. And every CO2 reduction, every molecule we are able to reduce from the atmosphere, coming from an oil and gas operation, coming from a power plant, or coming from uh, the isolation of, of, of a building, is a contribution to have a more sustainable world. So we have to take into account in this kind of financial instruments of every CO2 uh, action that is going to reduce the impact on climate change. I mean, with my previous uh, introduction of, of our goals, that I think that, that that's enough. I mean, as a, an introduction was, let me say, quite long. Uh, let me give you an idea of what you can expect uh, to hear. Mm today from, from us. I mean, we have a, an agenda. We are going to, to analyze three case uh, studies uh, to start uh, the morning. I mean, we have three, let me say, experts uh, with uh, managing uh, responsibilities in the company to lead this agenda. First, you hear from Alejandro Oliva. Alejandro Oliva is the director of strategy and planning of the company. And uh, you are going to present what is the purpose and the rational uh, behind uh, our uh, recent acquisition of, of PSGO and how we are going to develop uh, this uh, electricity uh, business. The second case study is going to be presented by Fernando uh, Hurtado. Fernando Hurtado, today you are the director of HSE in our EMP uh, business, but I mean, you are going to talk about your past. Uh, Fernando has been the, the, the person uh, leading the execution of Regan, Regan uh, in the southwestern part of Algeria, in the in the middle of of the desert, uh, as you said, Fernando is the most um, the most arid place uh, on the planet. I mean, you led there this project that has been over the last decade one of the the tenth ten most important projects for for Repsol, and you are going to explain the the key figures, the the logistical difficulties of the project and the, how to manage this project with the scarcity of resources you could have or you have in, in, in the area. Regan uh, is a unique project for, for the company and I think that is a good example of how people make a company grow. It's an, it's an example of execution, diversity, diversity of uh, people, uh, talent and, uh, and safety. And finally, but not less uh, important, Luis, in your new uh, function, uh, you are going to introduce the company key action lines 2018, uh, 2025 on, on environment and, and safety. On top of that, uh, uh, Arancha uh, Hernanz, Arancha Hernanz, she is the, the senior manager of strategy and, and control, and she is going to, to give us an overview of the key projects of the company where, where we are working in this kind of, of initiatives. And uh, Antonio, you are, I mean, I was talking about the, all, these, all, all these parameters, but you are the real expert uh, in, in, in climate change and in CO2 terms of, of the company. And he's going to present, Antonio, the new energy and the climate uh, goals. I mean, uh, to, to, to finish my, my introduction, let me say that we are uh, well positioned in Repsol with a strong commitments, uh, strong goals. We have clear targets. We have a path forward to integrate climate change scenarios into our business plan. We know that all that is going to be very challenging. 
uh, we are more than 25,000 employees fully committed and engaged uh, in the best safety and uh, environmental practices in, in our operations. Uh, we are fully committed to this kind of dialogue and, and collaboration we need with our uh, stakeholders. Uh, and we need that this roadmap is not going to be easy. And let me say, we have to work and and, and let me personalize a bit. Uh, as a CEO of the company, I have to work in a very difficult dilemma. And the very difficult dilemma is to have a clear vision about mm -hmm. the future, how Repsol has to be in 10, 15, 20 years. A less uh, carbonized Repsol. A Repsol fulfilling the targets in terms of climate change. Mm -hmm. A Repsol that is going to be part of the solution that the planet needs but at the same time, delivering every quarter, every quarter uh, about all these questions you are, of course, because it's your, your job, asking me every quarter in terms of PNL, in terms of, of cash generation, in terms of debt reduction, and so on. I mean, uh, both parts, uh, in a separate way, let me say that they are quite easy. I mean, every, it's quite easy to know how to deliver uh, every quarter but uh, not being concerned about the future of the company. It's very easy, let me say, to have a clear vision about the future, but with any kind of restrictions in terms of profitability and uh, delivery every quarter. I think that the real challenge is combine both things. We have clear metrics to that. We have a vision. We have an engaged team to pursue this, uh, this task. And we have clear metrics and we are going to report this metric every year, and you are going to have, I mean, the, the, the factors, the parameters to know that what we are doing is fully committed with this vision we have for the future. And of course, in the meantime, we have to deliver. We have to deliver in PNL terms and in cash terms. That is the, the challenge we have, but be sure that we have a team fully committed with this challenge and uh, fully prepared to do our best in this uh, pathway. And we need the dialogue with you because, I mean, perhaps I can't uh, realize these kind of things, but I prefer to be transparent and honest. We don't have all the solutions in this pathway. Things are going to change in the middle. We are going to see technological changes and so on. And this open dialogue is for us some kind of tool to help us to be more focused and to have more clear ideas in this uh, challenging way. So thank you for being here, and thank you for helping us in, in this uh, pathway that is going to be exciting, interesting, but not easy at all. Thank you.